All right, folks, why don't we get started? You're here for a spin session. Welcome. I'm Dr. Gallo. I'm a professor in biology. Um, and you're all here. I guess this is, there is something you do have to do. It's an assignment for your NUB. So you, you all have the sheets for that? Yes? Because you've been to the first one? Good. How many of you, just curious, bio majors? Chem? Biochem? Nursing? Education? How many is doing this just for fun? This is not, has nothing to do with what they think. Good. What's your major? Great. Well, you might need to know this. Who else? Uh, business. business. Good. I thought I saw another hand go up. Major. Yeah. Major? Uh, oh, cool. Well, good. Welcome. And it's not going to be technical, so you don't have to worry. Um, again, I chose this title eight months ago. They wanted volunteers. And I said, yeah, we'll do one on going viral. And it's kind of frightening because it's become so topical, as you've seen in the last few weeks in the news that we've had some real issues on this planet with a particular virus. And we will talk about that today. And I chose the title, What You Don't Know Can Hurt You. So I think it's really important for you to be here, maybe allay some of your fears, but more importantly, I think, to build up your knowledge base and get an idea as to what it's like to be in college uh, and you know, get some feel for that as we go today. So the first thing you're going to do is get your definitions. That's, you know, what is a virus and what isn't a virus. I mean, if you ask me about viruses, one of the things I'll say is they're not living. They're not alive. They use us. They use the kind of things that we're made of, but they don't do what we do. They don't grow. They don't metabolize. They replicate. So they're these replicating entities that are inside of us at times or many other kinds of organisms on this planet. We can find viruses that infect just about anything. Here's the blah, blah, blah slide. If you were a biology major and you learned this at some point, how viruses can get into a cell, replicate, take over the cell, and then get out of the cell. And what you saw on the first slide here, you could almost think about it. And no, this is not the going viral as you might do from a multimedia perspective. There's no cat videos today. So we're not going to see anything that was an internet sensation. We're not talking that kind of virus, but the same kind of phenomenon from one to another and then to others and others and others until it gets out of control. So that could be even within one organism, you know, cell to cell to cell, or within a population. So the same kind of idea of going viral, I guess, could be used for that. Now, when I think of viruses, I just made up a list for you here today. There's no real particular order except for the first one here on the bottom, Ebola. But for the rest of these, I just wanted to mention these um, briefly to give you some idea about some of the viruses out there in the world and, and what we know about them. Most of these you've probably heard about, or if you haven't, it's probably time that you have. The first one up here on my list, smallpox, is this. Yeah. So if you think about chicken pox, think about chicken pox times 10. Okay, smallpox used to be feared. Um, some cases in some outbreaks and some pandemics, about a third or more of the individuals who contracted it would die. And you die because you become essentially a bunch of oozing pustules inside, outside, all over your body. And if they don't kill you by themselves, usually you get some kind of secondary infections from something, whether it's some ba bacterium or some other virus or something else that kills you. So this was something that was really, really feared around the world. And again, we've had pandemics over the millennia that have killed large numbers of individuals. What have we learned? Well, lots. One of the things that was this is a success story for humans. We've actually made a vaccine for this. In fact, we've eradicated this thing from our planet, almost. In the 70s, there was the last wild case of smallpox. But since that time, it's all been in presumably two locations, the CDC in Atlanta, Georgia, and in Russia in, in a secure vault. And that, or so we thought. And then last fall, there was a freezer found in a research lab. And a person had retired, an older guy, and they decided, hey, let's go in and clean out this freezer. Well, guess what? Some of the vials looked pretty suspicious. And when they started to read the labeling on them, they found out, hey, guess what? There was smallpox in these things, too. So even though we thought we had eliminated smallpox from this planet, except for two sources, we were wrong. So it is something to be of some concern, uh, especially for you, because none of you have been vaccinated for, for it, because we thought that it was gone from this planet. Old guys like me don't have to worry about it, because I got vaccinated as a kid. 
yeah, I was born before 1975, so uh, it happens. There were people before then. Um, the next one is the flu. The flu is one of the biggest killers. This chart, unfortunately, doesn't go back far enough, but if I would have had it back here to the, the, the 19-teens during World War I, the flu killed about twice as many people as the war. So we think about how bad World War I was, but the flu killed more people, almost twice as many as uh, died from, from that. Now, over the years, you can see that there's these spikes where it killed large numbers. Again, you're near World War II here, and then other times where there's been these outbreaks and, and, and large numbers of deaths from it. So this is deaths per 100,000. Um, and so hundreds of hundreds of thousands is, you know, in the millions. So we're talking lots and lots of people die from the flu. And in fact, yearly, it's one of the biggest killers. It's one of the biggest viral killers uh, on this planet. Uh, it does show some other things here that people think are the flu. So rhinoviruses, that's the cold. The cold is not the flu. Trust me, you'd know the difference if you c contracted both of them. And then a couple of other things that are kind of like the flu but aren't the flu. So they're saying there are other things that some people think are the flu, but they're not really the flu. SARS or MERS, some of you have probably heard of these. These, again, are respiratory syndrome. Uh, these diseases, again, infect the, the respiratory tract. But one of the things you'll notice about these, not a large number of individuals that died. So from this SARS-MERS, we're only talking several thousand. Not so bad. But what's scary about them is this. 14% of all documented MERS cases ended in death. 14% is pretty high. Uh, if this is something that went global, which in fact you can see it has, the question should arise in your mind is, well, why didn't 14% of the population of these places die. And so we found ways to manage or control some of these agents like that. And you know, it's really interesting and we have to think about that as we consider these because yes, it's a biological entity, but there's a lot of social implications, how we treat the disease, what we do. And these have changed over time. We'll talk about some history here as to what we've done about disease states. So this one in particular, uh, frightening, yes. I mean, show of hands, how many of you want to die right now? 14% of you, I'm going to just bump you off right now. We'll just get rid of this row. Oh, no, sorry, not this, uh, that row. There you go. So <laughs> anyway, um, see, you just got spared. Pretty good, huh? Yeah, nice. So um, scary, scary stuff. This one, I'm sure you've all heard about this one, HIV or AIDS. Um, what scared me the most is when I asked students um, a few years ago what percentage of people they thought had AIDS, and they said 30%, and I'm thinking, Okay, a third of you in this room have AIDS? That kind of scared me a lot. That well, for one thing, that they thought that, that many people had AIDS, but the other thing is that they had such a misunderstanding. Now, um, when I started teaching, uh, if I would have done this, this would have been zero. Yeah, that is true, wow. Um, but it's changed quite substantially, as you all know. And uh, again, there's been some really sad parts of this story, as you're probably familiar with. Now, where did it start? Africa. Why? Yeah. So in a couple months from now, here we have something called deer season. We go out, some people shoot deer, gut them, slice them up, bring them home. And there's some blood exchange. Again, you know, it's messy when you're cleaning the deer and that. In Africa, in many cases, it was due to Again, bushmeat, that they hunt other things because the animals that they have there aren't the same that we have here. They don't have white-tailed deer running around in Africa, but they do have other things like apes and gorillas and chimps. And so you shoot one of those, spear one of those, whatever, kill it, um, and uh, as you're cutting it up, you might actually contract it. And then it is possible from that point to then spread to other individuals through things like unprotected sex. So in Africa, it actually started out as something, transmission was typically from animals to humans, and then it would get from like husband to wife, and then it might get to others um, beyond that. Is there a question, comment? Oh, I was just wondering if like, I used to actually work for um, the guy that had HIV. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, in our country, why did it get here? And that was where the, the, the scenario changes. So then it started to show up uh, mostly due to unprotected sex, but it was in a certain population. It was um, homosexual males. And it really had a weird beginning where it was, again, some people that lived a certain kind of lifestyle where they went to, did a lot of clubbing, and they actually thought that it was due to some recreational drug because it sh you just saw it shut down their immune system. And they, in fact, first thought that, and then you had all the TV evangelists saying it was, the, it was God killing them. And then they started to have people like individuals that were receiving blood transfusions for other reasons that were catching it. It's like, well, wait a minute, Jerry Falwell, are you saying that this poor person is a hemophiliac should die just because they're a hemophiliac? And so we recognize that, that there was a disease associated with it. It wasn't due to drugs. It wasn't due to homosexual lifestyle per se, but it was due to a virus that was being transferred from person to person. And we found ways to maybe cut back on transmission, but then there are other things like illicit drug use where there's IV drug use, where there's sharing of needles, or anything where there's blood-borne products that are shared, there can be a problem. And uh, nowadays, um, fortunately, to some extent, people live in our country. The number of people that are alive with HIV continues to climb because, well, the number of people with the, that have the disease and spread the disease continues to climb to some extent. I don't know what we would call this. I guess in a way it's a success story for the pharmaceutical industry. We found ways to make drugs to keep people alive. And, and it is a success story. It's magic, Johnson, um, for a number of people. But this is also kind of a sad part of it, which is who lives? Well, people in rich countries that can afford these drugs. These multi-drug cocktails that these individuals need to use cost lots and lots of money. People in Africa aren't receiving these. And hence, when you look at these numbers as to where there's large numbers of cases, large percentage of the population with this, they're not going to ever receive these drugs that cost you know, thousands and thousands of dollars a year for survival. They don't make thousands and thousands of dollars a year. They can't use all of their money for drugs. If they did, we'd call them crack addicts, right? Um, so anyway, that was a joke. You're allowed to laugh. You're in college now, OK? There's a slight change there. So anyway, what else can we think about from this? Well, is this good news, bad news? Well, you know, have we contained it? Perhaps, but not really. I think there's been some lax um, protocol, procedures, and, and, and behaviors in people because we think that you can live. We don't think of it as a death sentence anymore in this country. And so I think some risky behaviors are starting to sneak back into the population and people don't think that AIDS is something that's out there. They don't think HIV is out there. They think that it's treatable. It is. But you're still not HIV free. You, may not con you might not progress to AIDS, but you can still have the virus. And it could, in fact, at some time blow up and start to replicate again. Hepatitis. Hepatitis just means inflammation of the liver. When we talk about it from the viral perspective, there's hepatitis A, hepatitis B, hepatitis C. Guess what else there is? D, good, E, F. I mean, they just keep giving them new letters as they find new ones. And, and we're out to like F, G, I think, at this point. We keep finding these things that can cause real problems with your liver. Hepatitis A, how do you get that one? It's going to be a hard audience today. unwashed vegetables from a person who was handling them, didn't wash their hands. How many have ever been to a restaurant in your life? Wow, two of you. That's great. <laughs> um, uh, what's, what's the thing you see when you go into the restroom? Don't say a mirror. Uh, buy the mirror. What's the little sign? What's it say? Employees hands. must wash hands. Why do you think? It's because of things like this. There are many things that are transferred, and this is going to sound disgusting, from the fecal oral route. Hmm. Okay, so um, hand washing is really important for that. Certain viruses are fairly frail and fragile. And in fact, soap is enough to destroy them. So hand washing is really, really important to remove these things. So hep A is really easy to contract. It's oral, fecal, fecal, oral. It's a cycle. Uh, and if you ever noticed that, things goes in, comes out the other end, and sometimes ends up back in somebody else's. It's not good. But hep A, easy to catch, not really that lethal. Hep B, 
different story. Look at this as the number of people, they're saying antibodies to it, um, prevalence in some places in the world, it's over, you know, eight and even 10% in certain places. So hep B, which can lead to chronic liver failure and some other really nasty things, is actually quite dangerous. It requires a very different kind of interaction um, with an individual. And then there's also hep C, also very, very high percentages in certain parts of the world. It's one of these things that is, again, quite frightening. Usually uh, requires some kind of blood product uh, to be transferred from one person to another, but there are some places in the world where it's very, very, very high and uh, leads to a large number of issues, especially because it can lead to death. So when I go back, and if I did go back to my nasty list of viruses here, one of the things you'll see is I told you smallpox used to be really nasty and kill lots and lots of people. Influenza still kills lots of people every year. SARS and MERS, high lethality, but it hasn't spread for some odd reason. HIV AIDS, the pandemic obviously has caused a large number of deaths. We seem to be able to keep that at a minimum in this country, but still worldwide causes a large number of deaths. Hepatitis can cause deaths. This next one, rotavirus, I'm sure none of you are going to answer this if I ask you what is it. Of course not. It's a virus. It is a virus, thank you, yes. Anybody have any idea what it causes? My, my roommate used to, uh, in college, used to call me, um, what did he call me? Um, <laughs> well, all sorts of things, but uh, once I can tell you about, uh, I can, think he called me skids because he said I always had the runs. Because um, I was running a lot, sorry, <laughs> cross country, <laughs> cross country, that kind of run. Rotavirus causes the shits, diarrhea. This probably kills more than any of those other things I've talked about already. The runs causes death? Are you kidding? How? Why? Where? I'll show you the where, oh, if I go the right way. Where are these people dying? Africa. Africa. What age? Less than five. There, you know math. <laughs> you know what the less than sign is. Good. So, in this country, you get the shits, you end up on the porcelain throne for a while, and you get over it. If you're, if you're a six-month-old baby in Africa and you get diarrhea, you dehydrate and die. Leading, probably the leading cause of viral deaths in the world is rotavirus, the runs, the shits. How sad is that? You know what's really sad about it? It doesn't have to be lethal. If you gave that kid Gatorade, they'd live. And in fact, they do. They use something very similar to that. They call it electrolyte replacement fluid. Uh, it's essentially sugar water with some salts, and they live. It costs a few pennies to save a kid. And yet, in some nations, they can't afford that. Obviously, we, we, as humanitarian aid, provide many of these sorts of things to these nations to help to, to, um, to stay this kind of, of death. But essentially, it's still a very big problem. Again, the World Health Organization here is trying to get a hold on this because it is something, it's very rapid, it can kill you within a day. Uh, one of the problems is, obviously, you need to have clean water to give to that child and you don't have that in certain nations. So even if you give them this electrolyte replacement, they usually run into problems. Now you're going to say, well, why don't I need to do this? Well, in this country, what happens? This virus gets in, and you know, you saw how it goes viral and infects and infects and infects all those cells on my first slide. I just like those numbers go crazy. Okay, so you get a whole bunch of numbers of viruses. They infect all your cells. You flush them out, essentially, no pun intended. And then the cells that can get, get infected are kind of gone, and you have to grow new ones. Well, during that time frame, essentially all the virus gets washed out of you too, and you live, okay? Because you can go to the fridge and, and grab a, a cold one, something to drink to keep you going until uh, the virus essentially washes out. But that's not true with the rest of the world. So sad um, statement here. Hemorrhagic fevers, things that cause you to bleed out. There's a large number of things that do that. Now, these have a different thing. I'm going to put a line here right here, and I'm going to say that line is the equator. Hmm, what do you see about those diseases? They're all tropical. They're all really near the equator. And the reason is most of these are caused by, or at least spread by, mosquitoes. 
Do we have mosquitoes here? Yes, but we have something else. It's called October, November, December, January, February, March, April, May, um, where it's cold. It's so cold that, how cold is it? It's so cold that we sometimes don't have mosquitoes, or in fact, we kill all the ones that are here, right? The cold kills them, almost. Um, I can tell you that I did a study a few years ago where we actually went down to the Naira Gorge along the, the escarpment, and we actually went into these caves, and we looked like, um, I can't even tell you because you don't know the movie Ghostbusters, right? Have you ever heard of it? Yeah, so we went down into these caves with these big vacuums on our back, and we looked just like Ghostbusters, and we're sucking not plasma or whatever they do in that movie, but rather it was mosquitoes off the sides of the walls, and we're testing them to see if any of them had certain viruses in them. And so even though we do live in a climate where they can't really make it, there are some that hang on from year to year. And it's really kind of creepy to think an, a mosquito could just stick on the side of a wall all winter just waiting till spring to come back out from that cave. Um, but it does happen. But for the most part, we don't have the kind of mosquitoes. Ours are different than these mosquitoes. We don't have these here. And so some of these diseases just don't get spread here. Is dangerous, but not a problem to any great extent here. Uh, encephalitis, meningitis, again, some of these ones you can see they're just tracking in one part of the world. Again, if you think about where the equator is, these things are spread in, in really high numbers uh, in certain locations. Now, do we have encephalitis, meningitis, other things like that in this country? Yes, we do. And in fact, bacterial one, you are all vaccinated for, right? Requirement for you to come on campus. Good, because it can be spread and can cause real problems, leading to sometimes even death. All right. Um, this one. Again, a story where in this country, we don't see it anymore. Why? We have vaccines. Do I always answer my own questions? Apparently, yes. Because if I wait for you, I'll die of old age. <laughs> so anyway, um, I'm teasing. <laughs> Polio used to be a real threat in this country as well. It was a sad, sad route, too, that people were afraid of certain things. They were afraid to let their kids go out and play. Uh, they were afraid to let their kids go to the swimming pool because, again, this is another disease. Even though we think of it as being something that causes paralysis, you contract this via the oral fecal route that you actually ingested it. So you went to the swimming pool, you're swimming around, you drink a little bit of the water, unfortunately, and it has the virus in it, gets through your intestinal tract, gets into your nervous system, and causes paralysis. Um, these are not old pictures. This is still happening today. So even though in our country, you're treated. And you know how? Actually, treating isn't the right word. Well, you're vaccinated. You're immunized. And in fact, the way we do it is like this, although this is really kind of looks sort of mean. I don't know. How many of you want to go to a doctor that seems to do this to you? That kid looks pretty frightened, don't you think? All they're doing is giving them a drop of the virus. But it's a weak form of the virus. And this form of the virus cannot cause polio. Your body gets infected. Your body builds up antibodies to it, and then you're protected against the wild, virulent strain of this virus. And hence, you'll never get polio then. This is a good thing. We're trying to do this for the whole world. So the World Health Organization is trying. It hasn't seen any cases in India in three years. And that's just a wonderful thing. However, we're not done. There are many other places where we still have polio in this world, and we're still trying to eradicate it. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has given billions, yeah, it's with a B, billions of dollars to try to eradicate this from the planet. All we need to do is immunize everybody, give them a drop of this virus. And I don't know why they do it this mean and nasty way. Why don't they just put it in a lollipop and give it to the kids? You know, every kid would want a lollipop. How many of you would want a lollipop? Yeah, of course. Just give you some candy. You'd, you'd have the virus in you then, and, and then you would be immunized for life. Um, and you would actually poop out that, that weak form of the virus, and it would get into the swimming pool, and then other people would get um, immunized. So I'm not telling any of you to eat lollipops and poop in pools, but <laughs> if it so happened, and you happen to have one with the polio, the weak form of the polio virus, you actually would be doing a good thing. Doesn't sound very nice, though, to poop in somebody's pool, but uh, well, well. Anyway, uh, again, we're trying our best do this. And I think when I say these words, I have to be a little bit more careful. And I, and I want to at least give you, here's your lesson plan for the day. Uh, three terms, because you love it when you have terms, because then somebody could ask you a question on an exam, right? There you go. See, you start writing. They're trained from years of this in high school. Um, 
And these are three words I'm going to use right now for you, and you can think about them this way, prevention, treatment, and cure. And probably even another one I should throw in there too, um, diagnosis or acknowledgement, uh, recognizing the disease exists. That's probably the first thing. And we, we notice sometimes things, like we notice a cow acting a little weird, and we call it mad cow disease. And it takes us a while to figure out that it's actually an agent that causes mad cow disease. And this agent is actually an infectious protein, and this infectious protein can cause neurological issues. And it's the same one that we see in certain symptoms in us. And in fact, maybe it can get from cows to us, which causes other sorts of things. And we see it in other animals too, like chronic wasting disease in deer and elk and other things like that. Um, and so on and so forth. So diagnostics is probably the first thing. We do that. Um, I'll give you another great example here. It's not really a virus. Well, actually, it is a virus. Diabetes. It's a history lesson. Just what you wanted. Um, you, you missed the history right here, but here, we'll, we'll throw in the mystery and the history here. Diabetes. Here's our history lesson for all of you. Any of you pre-med? Show hands. Great. How do you think that they used to know, see there's a history term right in a way, that a person had diabetes? Taste. And what would they taste? They'd taste their urine. Yeah, there's a horrible urine test you want to fail, right? Because um, <laughs> it would be sweet. Um, they have a problem with sugar. It doesn't get taken up by the cells because without insulin, the cells aren't receiving the signal to take up the insulin. So how many of you still want to be pre-med? <laughs> yeah, you're not tasting urine though, right? Okay, good, good. So anyway, recognize that life has, has changed. Again, like I said, first thing we normally recognize is diagnosis. We recognize, and I said, gee, virus with diabetes, juvenile diabetes, shocker. There's been a, a lot of evidence pointing to this one virus, this Coxsackie virus that looks like a protein on the surface of some of your cells in your pancreas. Your body goes off and attacks that virus, but when it's done attacking that virus, it goes, what else looks like this? Guess what? It's your pancreas. It's your beta islet cells. Kills them, you no longer make insulin in juvenile diabetes. And there's really intriguing evidence for this. Um, it's something probably none of you have heard of before, but uh, it, it's this thing that it's, it's stymieing because we don't know how to prevent or pr protect from it. Again, some of these other terms I had here. So the other thing is treatment. Again, lessening the symptoms. You know about that. Like if you catch a bacterial infection, we give you an antibiotic. So it can, um, uh, oh, sorry, that, no, that's cure I just mentioned. Lessening the symptoms. Again, you might do that. You get a, a, a cold or something. You go take a Sudafed or something else like that to help. But prevention is the one we really want to go after with some of these viral things that I mentioned. To never get the disease in the first place. We do that mostly through immunization, vaccinations. All right. So here's my last one on my top 10 list, and it's the one that I think that everybody's heard so much about the last few days, weeks, months, uh, Ebola. Now, why do we worry about Ebola? Do any of you? Any of you heard of it? Any of you ever turned on the news in the last couple months? Ever, any of you ever used the internet for anything other than watching cat videos? <laughs> or, or dumping ice water on yourself? It's Nothing? It, it is, I know. Um, Ebola has, as you've seen, made it into the news for a large number of reasons. Now, first off I'm going to do is um, show you a couple pictures and I'm going to ask you, what do you think they're doing here? What's that? Gardener's, gardener's heaven? <laughs> I didn't hear what you said. Oh, gardeners can get it. Good guess. Draining out water from the boots. So he's saying that how they could contract it. Now, maybe not gardeners, but something else you sometimes bury. Bodies, that's right. So we might be cleaning these things, they're disinfecting, and after we've cleaned them in these countries, we have to do something with them, right? right? This is not the US of A. Guess what? When you're done using something in these countries, you're going to use it again and again and again. So you have to find some way to clean it if you can. 
This one's a tricky one. Again, if you're in the lab, you might see this, but this might be, in fact, I'm going to just say, I'm going to lie to you and tell you, hey, this is ZMAP. That's the stuff that they're using right now. You've heard of in those two individuals from the U.S. that were flown back and given this drug. It really isn't a drug. It's actually an antibody that binds to the virus and blocks it from binding to your cells. What are they doing here? Disinfecting, cutting off the flow. Yeah, so in fact, they are, these are healthcare workers in Africa, and they are, after they've removed some, I think these people are actually helping to, to gown up the workers, and so these individuals then needed to be cleaned after they were done as well. Who's that? No, he's not a basketball player that just won the. Oh, sorry, go ahead. and was brought back to our country, and here he is uh, after receiving ZMAP, um, high-fiving everybody as he leaves. Um, what are they doing here? Yeah, what's, what's, what's happening here? They're asking for the storage of something. This is just a bag of water. Quarantine has changed dramatically in some of these countries. In the good old days, um, and, and this is a sad part of, of history. See, I use that word again. Huh? Um, and, and, and in fact, I'm going to try to get this as a gen ed requirement for social, too. That what, what was done in the past, if somebody caught Ebola in, the, in, in Africa, here's what was done. They'd be in their hut. They'd close it. They'd put food and water right by the entrance, and if they could crawl to it and eat and drink, that's great. If they recovered, they could come back and join the tribe. If they didn't, and they died, they burned it. Perfect for quarantine. What do we do now? We take them out of civilization. And we take them where? Um, places that we can't. We call them hospitals. They, we put them in places <laughs> where we can do something. So, We've gone to countries like that in our humanitarian efforts and built a hospital. And now, what do you do when you get sick? You go to the hospital. How many of you last year saw with the flu? What did they tell you? Don't bother to come to the doctor's office. We don't want to see you because all you're going to do is spread it to others. Well, in some of these nations, again, hospitals are a good thing. We know hospitals are a good thing here. But if they become the site or the source of spread of infectious disease, that becomes quite frightening, doesn't it? So um, quarantine took on a very different venue recently, not only because the hut was replaced by the hospital, but now the hut and the hospital were replaced by cities. This was the first time Ebola really hit big time in cities. And so now you have a big problem where you have to quarantine an entire city. And that's really hard because some of these cities don't have the infrastructure our cities do. And so you can't just turn on the water faucet. And you can't just get all the food you need at the market. And in fact, all that's going to get shut down at times anyway. So these poor people now are stuck in a city with nothing. Can't leave. Can't do anything. Speaking of can't leave, um, sometimes there were some places, and we can talk about this, where the quarantine, there is ways to get in and out. What are they doing in this picture? Probably taking their temperature. They're using a remote infrared sensor to check their temperature. If you don't have a fever, they allowed you to pass. If you have a fever, guess what? You're not getting out of the quarantine zone. What's this? A guard at a quarantine center. You know what scares me the most about this picture? Well, that's kind of scary, but you know what's even scarier to me? This guy right here. <laughs> he just walks right around the quarantine. We got to worry, a quarantine is really tough to do. Maybe on a road you can do it, but gee, people don't all use cars, as you can see right here. We have to worry about that. I mean, we have those hostile neighbors here, we call them Canadians. Uh, we got to kind of worry about them. I mean, they can't walk across the border, luckily. Well, they could, I guess, at the bridges. But um, this epidemic, and let's hope it remains that and doesn't become a pandemic to spread around the world, although I guess in some ways it has with Ebola, has become a real problem because we can't seem to do this. We can't seem to stop everything, everyone, from spreading it. And that's really quite scary. Um, I guess it's time to show something. It's show and tell time, isn't it? I lost something. 
So anyway, um, it's spreading right now, and that's kind of scary and bad and dangerous. But how does it spread? I don't know. You could imagine all sorts of ways. It could be from the natural way, or it could be some unnatural way. Let's just say that there's some crazy man. Not that you would know any. If I pop it, you're going to scream? No, you're not. Let's see. Oh, virus everywhere. Now what? Now what? I didn't hear you scream. Anyway, it was, ba it was baby powder. Okay. <laughs> Coated with virus. All right. So anyway, um, so now there's virus everywhere. So what are you going to do? You've got to go to the hospital, right? Come on, it's time for you to come to the hospital. <laughs> so here you go. We don't have an ambulance because we're in Africa, so we just throw you on our bed, take you back. Here's the cot. Now look at that beautiful, clean cot. Well, because this is the cot that was used before you came in for Ebola for a woman who had a baby, and before that it was a person who broke their arm, before that it was a person who was bit by a monkey, or before, and, and so on and so forth. It's not like our country. Guess what? That same cot gets used again and again and again. And so that person that comes in for one agent can obviously and easily, easily, yeah, right, easily pick up something else like Ebola. Now, that's pretty scary. But you know what's even more scary? This. You're in one of those villages or countries, and all of a sudden people come to visit your village, and they're dressed like this, or worse. What would you think? That they're, that they're about to capture bees. Yes, you must be an apiary <laughs> expert. <laughs> you might think something else, however. Anybody think anything else? <laughs> Again, as these World Health Organizations come into play at this point, they come into these villages, they dress up, they glove up, they wear all this stuff, and it's got to be really quite frightening for individuals in these places. They're saying, well, why do you need to do this? Why do you act this way? Why do you treat us as if there's something wrong with us? Maybe you're the one that's bringing this because you look quite evil. Well, only when I'm wearing this do I look evil, right? So there's going to be problems in these countries right now with our, our public relations, essentially, where we're probably uh, not helping, and we're probably stimulating lots of fear. Wow. Um, in some of these places. Now, um, what can be done? I don't know. I have a couple short video clips, and um, I'm going to kind of make them very quick, just because. The first one was me trying to make a timeline. Let's see that whole history thing taken over, huh, Tom? Um, and, and I love this one because, um, actually, I guess I should have seen when it started, but I can tell you as it's ending, look, most of you were born right about now. And look at how, in the 1995, 96, look, okay, 30, 60, two, zero cases, one case of, of death, and, you know, and look at the number of people that are dying from these different outbreaks, 41%, 100%, well, one person caught it, 70%, but look at the numbers, there's really not that many until we get to now, uh, where our numbers are over 1,500. Uh, I think they think that they've really approached over the 2,000 mark, mark at this point with no end in sight. In fact, um, in, in the video that I have here, I guess uh, Dr. Frieden, the head of the CDC, thinks that this outbreak won't stop optimistically until we have 20,000 deaths. Now, 20,000 deaths might sound like a lot, but again, if I went back to the influenza story, we kill, we kill. Many more people than that die every year from influenza. We sounded like I just made that virus. Honest, I didn't, uh, the influenza. But it is something to be concerned about. Why? Go back and remember, as we were seeing this scroll down, the percentage of people that die from it. It has a really high lethality, and I think that's one of the frightening parts. As is that moth. I'm not sure where he came from. Anyhow. I think that it's one of the things that we need to be concerned about. I don't really know if I have time to really show you the couple of these short clips, but I do want to uh, tell you that for many, many diseases, we can do something. Many of these viral diseases, we have something to do about them, and you know what that is, vaccination. 
immunization. And if you look at these numbers here, and the moth is going to help us, he's going to show you um, the annual pre and post immunization worldwide, or, or US immunizations for these things, is the number of people that died from these things. And you can see the success, the great success. And in fact, I could even tell you what's causing some of these numbers over here is people that decided that they don't want to get Jimmy or Johnny or Jenny or whatever vaccinated immunized because it's going to hurt to get it in the arm. Why do I say that? Well, because we have people out there that are trying to profess that. People like Jenny McCarthy. How many of you know who Jenny McCarthy is? A couple of hands went up. Good. You might know her because of this, that her, her former boyfriend was uh, Jim Carrey, and she had a son, uh, not with him, but uh, with somebody else, and her son, Evan, has autism, and she's trying to blame vaccinations. She's saying it's the mercury that's present in the vaccinations. Now, how many of you ever had a tuna fish sandwich in your life? Show of hands. Good. How many of you haven't? Really? There's people that have never had it. Okay. Um, you've probably had more mercury in that one tuna fish sandwich than you would from getting a vaccine. So the reality is it's, it's, it's fantasy in some of these people's minds. The other thing is, it's not used in most of these vaccines anymore anyway, and yet this, the numbers of autism are, are still there. So is this the reason why people listen to Jenny McCarthy? Because she was married to Jim Carrey and because she wrote a book about autism, Evan, and how he's special, and now I think she said he's cured? Or is it this? Um, Jenny McCarthy was known for a lot of other reasons a little bit earlier, well before you were born, and I think that maybe she still has a following, and that's one of the problems that I think people can get into the public eye, uh, no pun intended there, uh, in many ways, and um, they get a voice, and their voice sometimes is heard by people maybe more than it should be, and we've run into real problems because of this, that people start to believe these things. Now, everybody can have a belief. The problem is some of them are wrong, dead wrong can lead to the death of your child. And in fact, somebody started a, a website, and it's kind of a fun one to go to. It's called Jenny McCarthy Body Count. And it's a running tally as to how many people have died or become sick or died as a result of not being vaccinated for things that we have a vaccine for. And so I just clicked this the other day. So as of August 9th, there have been 137,000 preventable illnesses and probably over 6,000 deaths of people because they didn't want to get their child vaccinated. Something that we could prevent. How sad is that? Um, so do we need to worry? Uh, is Ebola going to come to Niagara University next week? Well, without balloons, I would say uh, probably not. Um, are we going to get it under control? Um, I'm not sure. Um, but when we start to think about diseases, we have to put things in perspective. If you look about world deaths, one of the big killers still is heart disease and stroke and then a few other things. But this isn't the world. This is the United States. If you start to look at first world high income countries versus third world uh, countries, there's a very different uh, breakout as to what kills people. In many of these countries, you see low respiratory infection, 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 stroke, um, disease, some, again, malaria, infection, birth complications, infection, uh, and then a couple that I can't tell exactly what they are, but very different outcomes. So diseases kill people in many other parts of the world. In ours, we end up to make it to some ripe old age and then die of heart disease or, or stroke. So I don't know. How's that for a nice take-home message for, to start off the semester, huh? Uh, that's it. I'm open for answering questions, but I know you probably, I'm the only thing stopping you to get the food or, or a nap. So I don't want to keep you for long, but if you do have any questions, feel free to ask. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of your NUB time here, your freshman orientation, and I'll see some of you Wednesday. Thank you. <laughs>